tributes have been paid to the former Liberal Democrat leader, Charles Kennedy, who died earlier this morning. Mr Kennedy served as an MP for the Scottish Highlands for 32 years, before losing his seat to the SNP last month, and was leader of the Liberal Democrats between 1999 and 2006. His leadership was most remembered for his opposition to the Iraq War in 2003, becoming the main party leader in Parliament to oppose the decision. His opposition to the conflict arguably allowed him to lead his party to its best general election result since the 1920s in 2005. Nathaniel Lema Sansom, The Report. Well, to discuss the last story that we've just seen, we have in the studio Dr. Evan Harris, Associate Director of Hacked Off and a former Liberal Democrat MP, and on the phone, Jeremy Corbyn, a Labour MP for Islington North. Evan Harris, let me start you first, uh, with you first of all. How do you remember Charles Kennedy? Well, I remember him when I was a student, because I'm five years younger than him, I suppose, and he was already an MP when I was a medical student, and he visited my university, Oxford University, um, SDP club, as it was then, uh, and then the Alliance. And I, like him, I was a member of the, of the SDP, and then I knew him when I was elected in 1997 as a very supportive senior member of parliament of my own age. And then, uh, and then as party leader, and he appointed me to the front bench to speak on health. Um, and uh, you know, he achieved very good results for us as a leader. So he, I wasn't very close to him. Uh, people say he had a sort of common touch. He could relate to people in a much better way than most senior politicians. Well, clearly it? he did. It's not for me to say, because I knew him professionally and as right. a friend. But yes, uh, he clearly had an effect. He, the, there were various facets to him. He was able to communicate. And secondly, uh, and not just secondly, he was one of the few people to survive, have I got news for you, and thrive on it as a politician rather than being the butt of the jokes and, and floundering. And Jeremy Corbyn, uh, what's your memory of him? Of course, he was in a different party from you, but you were a long time together in, in Parliament itself. Yeah, I first met Charles in 1983 when I was elected to Parliament at the same time as him. He came in as an FDP MP, I as a Labour MP. So clearly we're in very different parties with a very different perspective. And the election was very bitter between Labour and the SDP um, because SDP were challenging for Labour votes, basically. Uh, we were both appointed to a committee in Parliament to examine the Social Security Bill, a dreadful bill that the, that the then Conservative government brought in. And we worked quite well together. We, we fundamentally agreed on lots of issues of social justice. I always found him very warm, um, very friendly, and a very intelligent guy. And uh, despite the obvious um, party differences, I always got along very well with him for all the time we were together in Parliament. Well, of course, for many people, Charles Kennedy's main legacy was the principled opposition he took against the 2003 Iraq war. In fact, he became the main party leader in Westminster to oppose this move to war. Here's a clip of him speaking at that anti-war march back in February 2003, just before British troops went in. The arguments have been contradictory and inconsistent, and the information has all too often been misleading as well as inconclusive. It's no wonder that people are scared and confused. I say this to you quite seriously as somebody who personally happens not to be a pacifist but has the utter respect for anyone for grounds of conscience who is. As somebody who's not actually anti-American but is deeply worried by this Bush administration. And as someone who is under no illusions about the brutal dictatorship and the appalling regime, which is Saddam Hussein. Well, Evan Harris, I mean, how brave was it to make a speech like that to oppose the war? I mean, a lot of British people, of course, were against it. Yes, it was braver than people think now, uh, back, because now it's, he's, he's vindicated and lots of people think that there was quite a large... Uh, anti-war movement but the opinion polls were in favor of taking military action uh, for various reasons mainly based on the scare stories and the what turned out to be false claims of al-qaeda influence and links in iraq and uh, coupled of course with the false claims of weapons of mass destruction and uh, and uh, and the press was mostly with a few notable exceptions also gung-ho 
for war, but in Parliament as well. It's hard being the leader of a, a third party in Parliament. You get a lot of heckling, but normally you're opposing the government with another opposition party or uh, you're uh, opposing, you're joining the government in attacking one of the other big parties, the big opposition party. On this occasion, Charles Kennedy was taking on both the front bench of the Labour, of the Gov Labour government and the Blairite ranks, I exclude Jeremy from that number, as well as most of the Conservative Party and its front bench. So vitriol of, of, of being, us being naive or stupid or opportunistic, bizarrely, was thrown our way and it took guts and a steely determination that Charles didn't show publicly but I know he had to maintain his principled position that there was simply not a case for going to war and he's been vindicated now as have other anti-war politicians of the year including Jeremy but at the time it didn't necessarily it was a big chance to take politically even if there was no question uh, of, of us not doing it and he achieved the whole of the Liberal Democrat Party, which was quite a parliamentary party, which was quite big in those days, uh, into the lobbies with him, which was also no mean and achievement. Do you, and do you think it was a, a factor in the fact that the Lib Dems increased their number of seats in the election of 2005, just yes. two years later? Yes, I think it was, because uh, clearly it's important to be known to have a distinctive position as a third party because the media isn't kind to third parties in a, in a, in a general election campaign or especially the time before it and also there were a lot of people who were disillusioned with the Blair uh, with the Blairite uh, legacy of Blair Brown legacy of partnering with George Bush on this war as well um, so so in 2005 I'm certain that it was a, a factor uh, an important factor in improving on the performance in 2001 but also he was a very good leader in the television age I mean, I personally was frustrated that he had very little interest in the detail of the policy I was I think at the time uh, I did health but I also did higher education I remember clearly that he didn't know the detail of our tuition fee policy the famous one when we first developed it but uh, but he was never asked the detail because he was so disarming even of uh, journalists who would consider themselves to be uh, quite sharp. And Jeremy Corbyn, let me put the same question to you that I just put to Evan Harris. I mean, do you think it did show great courage to oppose the war as a party leader in 2003, the Iraq war? Well, as we went through 2002, there was clearly growing discontent about the intention of the US to attack Iraq. It started with the uh, uh, straight the Union address by George Bush with the axis of evil and so on. Um, but it was very important that the uh, Liberal Democrats eventually came down to a position of opposing the war because, uh, like all parties, it's a pretty broad church and there were some quite conservative elements in the Liberal Democrats who probably wanted to join together in this uh, so-called hour of national need and go to war. Um, I was one of 139 Labour MPs that voted against, plus Dennis Skinner, who was uh, undertaking heart surgery at the time and therefore obviously couldn't be present. Um, Charles then managed to persuade the Liberal Democrat parliamentary group to vote uh, for an amendment, which uh, was that the case for war had not yet been made. And that was, uh, amendment was deliberately so crafted in order to entice in some Conservatives as well as probably some of the more centre-ground Labour MPs. Uh, I also voted against the main question, which was that we go to war at all. There were two votes that day. Uh, his participation was important at that time. The sadness was that, A, we didn't win the vote, and B, that the war went ahead. And I think there is now quite clearly a sense of vindication of it, not just in the vote, but also in the consequences for the people of Iraq, the growth of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, but also the damage to the civil liberties in every European country. And quite often in the subsequent parliament after 2005 to 2010, when there was more um, anti-terror legislation, I would often find myself in the same lobby as Charles, uh, standing up against 90 days and a number of other aspects of anti-terror legislation. So I think he was a very warm individual. He clearly had his demons. 
uh, I was always worried about the amount of smoking and drinking he did, and I think it's very sad because he clearly had a huge contribution to make, and I'm very sorry at um, his sudden passing. The last conversation I had with him was in March. He seemed in pretty good form. He realized the election was going to be difficult, but didn't seem to me to be too depressed about it all, and I was looking forward to seeing him again. I just want to go back, if I can, to the, the Iraq war, yeah. because there was the Brent East by-election just yeah. after the war, in which the Liberals surged ahead, and it's quite a Muslim community constituency. So do, do you think there was, he always continued this effort to win Muslims over to the Lib Dem side? Yes, I mean, we were called the Liberal Democrats in those days. The Liberal Party had merged with the SDP some years before. Um, I, there's no doubt that that victory was in part due to the population, the, con the constituency's opposition to the, uh, to the Iraq war. Not just uh, Muslim voters, but other voters as well. But yes, I think that's right. And therefore, I mean, Charles was a very lucky leader because of all the, the by-elections there could have been, there weren't that many where he could have got that boost. It wasn't an easy time, uh, generally. I mean, it was at the... You know, the Labour government was still very popular and the Conservatives were, were also, you know, having been in opposition for at least one term, were, were capable of good performances in by-elections. So he always, I thought, attracted luck. Yes, there's no doubt that that seat was won and then held uh, in 2005 uh, and then 2000, sorry, in 2010 on, on that basis. One thing I would say, I mean, Jeremy's right that it took, there was a debate within the Liberal Democrats about how far we could go in opposing this. Because the party is, was not, and is not anti-American. Secondly, there are some people who have a reputation in the party, Paddy Ashdown, Ming Campbell, for being liberal but hawkish. You know, no one's pushover on, on defence and foreign affairs. And thirdly, as Charles said, that he and most Liberal Democrats were not pacifists. And a lot of people, not everyone, in the anti-war movement more broadly were anti-American or, um, or were pacifist. And there was a separate debate about whether Charles should go on that march and make that speech because of some of the elements that made up the march were considered to be uh, not people we would want to be associated with. Uh, not Jeremy, but others in there. But he made the, again, and there were concerns, but again he made the right call because you've got to be able to, you know, share the table with people you don't agree with and you strongly disagree with when you have a common cause of such importance which committing troops to war was so i think jeremy's right to point out that and i think it makes him a greater man that he had to overcome an internal debate and make more than one tough decision which was unpopular at the time i stress that it was not it was not a finger in the wind job and, and jeremy i mean one of the other big issues from which he felt passionately charles kennedy felt passionately was europe and of course, we're coming up to a potential referendum in a year or two's time. Would he have been a real big voice in, in that campaign to have Britain stay in the European Union, do you think? Oh, absolutely, because the whole founding of the SDP was as much about the European Union as anything else. Um, certainly, the founders of the SDP were very, very pro the European Union to the extent of uh, complete lack of criticism of it almost. Uh, Charles was keen on the European Union. He often talked about that, often spoke about it. And uh, I think he would be appalled if we ended up with a referendum campaign, which was a sort of a, a race between um, nationalism and xenophobia without any real discussion about human rights, workers' rights, environmental standards across the whole continent. But yes, it was very much the basis of his politics. He'd also studied in the USA, had quite a good knowledge of the USA, and uh, he didn't pretend to be on, on the left in politics. He wasn't. He was a kind of centre-ground um, liberal Democrat, but he made a very important decision at a very important time, particularly um, on Iraq. And I think it's interesting that uh, all the tributes today, all of them, um, bring in the, the question of the Iraq war, but I would also bring in his questions on civil liberties and on human rights, where he was equally uh, determined and courageous. Well, thank you for that. Before we go to the break, the death of Charles Kennedy has actually been getting Twitter trending. 
Philip Robinson, for example, tweets tragic news about Charles Kennedy, a hugely gifted politician who was widely admired and respected. Deepest sympathy to his family and friends. At Phil SPM adds, not a fan of Charles Kennedy on a political level, but by all accounts a principled and decent man taken well before his time. And former Guantanamo prisoner Moazam Beg paid respects, his respects to Mr. Kennedy's work for the oppressed, saying he was one of the few British politicians who helped Beg's father in campaigning for Moazam's release. He tweets, Charles Kennedy was one of the few politicians who supported my dad's fight against Gitmo when few cared or listened. And lastly, Carol Ann Grayson, who's the executive producer of the Oscar-nominated documentary Incident in New Baghdad, tweets, Charles Kennedy had the common sense when most politicians were utterly useless on Iraq. He opposed the war. Well, we've come to the end of the second part of the program, but do join us after the break. Well, we'll be looking at the trial of former Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi, who was, which was due to be held today in Cairo, but was postponed. Don't go away. <laughs>